Dr. Evans Agri, da going to delve further into this matter. Uh, Dr. Evans Agri. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us here on the program. Very much for having me. What are your own thoughts? It's, it's time for a third force on the political landscape here in the country. Uh, can you can you repeat that, please? I'm asking if it's time for a third force in in the lands uh, political landscape here in the country. Uh, well, there has always been the need for a third force. Uh, well, with the multi-party democracy, does not necessarily mean you need to have. Uh, um, so many political parties. Uh, at least what you need are parties which are credible, very credible to really contest elections. That's critical. Um, I would think that the various political parties should have the capacity to organize themselves very well. Now, if you, in, you, know, you see, when you really have a multi-party, what is all that it means is that we have parties which are very credible, can have alternatives waiting along, you know, alongside you know, the key actors who are actually governing. And now, and that actually has a certain function, or it performs an oversight function fundamentally, so that the government in power knows that there are others on the sideline who are capable of... Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Hello? All right, please go ahead. Yeah, so my argument is that when you have credible alternatives in waiting, it serves the nation very, very well, because... The party in government knows very well that it is not able to conduct its business effectively. There are others who have the capacity of wrestling power from them come the next elections. So it means there will be very little or few policy slippages because they will be guided by the fact that there are others who are equally competent you know, on the sideline waiting to capture political power. Yeah. But, but the concern has been the fact that this, the smaller parties or the parties you would describe as small may not be formidable enough uh, to, to create that third force. If they, were, if they were to take advantage of the moment now, how should they go about it? Well, of course, you know, I don't think that um, because there are divisions within the MPP, um, it gives any, it gives the other parties, smaller parties, opportunity to, to, to as it were, uh, become a third force. They've always had the opportunity to be the third force. Um, I have always argued that they have not been able to close their ranks. Too many personality clashes or personal interests. If you really want to um, rally around the ideologies of Nkrumah and revise it, and be pragmatic because uh, in the 21st century we are looking at what is, what work or what works what is workable and so pragmatism is a way to go so instead of saying that everybody wants to be a president you need to rally around some key ideologies and then be able to you know forge a united front i mean if you are looking at encomiasm for instance then it's critical the various splinter groups must come together and once they come together they constitute a potent force to reckon with but within the MPP itself, you know, a party which has had the opportunity to govern this nation for eight years should know better. Uh, I believe that they should shelve partisan interests and a show of force, what I call a show of naked power. Mm. Because the naked power will not really rally the forces that you need to, to, to be to, around certain key goals, around certain key vision, around certain key ideologies and so on, to be able to wrestle power from an incumbent, you know, party which is very much interested in consolidating itself in power. So the least you can do is to close your ranks and make your party as attractive as possible by, by you, know, un, you know, dealing with all those physical tendencies, divisive tendencies, you know, ha which have the capacity mm. of drawing people, or drawing people away, you know, as it were, drive people away from, from the main business of really forging a united front. I mean, that is mm. critical. And I think if, if this is if, if it's lost on the leadership, then they have a long way to go. For me, if they not if the MPP is not able to close their ranks, I will say that it's a failure of leadership. Let's talk about the, the people of Ghana as well. Are the people of Ghana ready for a third force? Will the people of Ghana be receptive of that third force? Well, you see, Ghanaians also want to vote for winnable candidates. Mm. 
and Ghanaians are also very much interested. Apart from other interests like partisan, I mean, ethnic cleavages that the politicians normally want to use to to to, to mobilize votes, etc. I think that by and large, if we are also interested in issue-based politics, uh, we should be able to say that look, you are organized, you have a better platform, as, as it were. You have a, a good manifesto, workable manifesto, not manifesto which is a litany of campaign promises, but a workable program, achievable, not idealistic, but things that will work. Now, when you have these things, I think you should be able to deal with some of the cleavages and be able to close your ranks. And mm. then, uh, of course, Ghanaians will vote, vote for people who are organized, mm. people they think that can turn their fortunes around. I think, by and large, we will be interested in leadership that is transformational and which can turn our dreams into realities, aspirations that we wish for ourselves. We are dignified people, and we want to be governed well, by and large. Mm. Well, one would imagine that the Ghanaian people are tired of promises, uh, long list of promises and manifestos, and yet when these parties manage to make it into office to govern the country, a lot of these uh, be be become empty promises. They, they, they do not materialize. What sort of third force will appeal to the Ghanaian people right now? Well, you see, you need... You need a group of people who perhaps have a track record, people who will use very temperate language, people who will have mass appeal, people who have organizational skills, people who respect the sensibilities of Ghanaians, people who understand local politics, people who respect the various traditions, I mean, uh, traditional systems, who have local knowledge, and so on. People who can organize themselves, course, backed by the requisite resources, because in politics, we are not prepared to spend, forget. So resources are critical. Um, you also want to see a group of people who would demonstrate that uh, even in party politicking, they will be prepared to listen to dissenting views. You don't want insolence of office, arrogance of power, etc. These things will, will drive people away from, from, from party politics. If we are not careful, you see, in, in democracy, Participation of the people is critical, but participation will not come, or people will not participate when they see the test being muddied with a lot of uh, personality attacks and so on. If we really want to develop this country uh, into, into a very vibrant, prosperous one, then we must be interested in issue-based politics. Of course, in politics, anything is possible, and there are, there's a tendency for people to use other methods. I would say unconventional methods to gain power, but at least when majority of the people think that this is the way to go, it will be difficult for any single individual to swim against the tide and use other unconventional methods. If that is not our tradition, people mm. will not resort to that. Uh, we need to build a tradition that is enduring, that is much more prosperous, mm. and that is winning. I mean, something that we can be proud of. Yes. Let's look at the general landscape in the country. We're looking into the possibility of a, of a third force within that political landscape. The qualities you have mentioned already, do you see that on the political landscape beyond the NDC and the NPP? Well, you know, the primaries have the capacity, have a really huge chance. You see, sometimes you don't only win, you can also change no decisions. You can change the dynamics. Now, if any third force is able to garner more than 3% of the vote, it will definitely throw the election into a runoff. And you see, that also gives you an advantage to be able to negotiate good things for your party. You see, once you are able to win some seats, or once you're able to negotiate some key positions for the party, it gives the party some resources. It gives the party the experience, the exposure, it gives the party some visibility. And then you can then build on from there to, to be able to, you know, achieve the target that you set for yourself. You see, if you look at the 2000 election that the MPP won, they won partly because of their presence in parliament in 2006. Mm. We talk about Osama Malfos, talk about J.H. Mensah, talk about Nanando himself, and talk about others who were in there, you know, negotiating and arguing very well for you know, uh, fine tune in you know, our public policies and programs. You see, this, these things give the indication to our guys. And look, these are a group of people given the opportunity can turn their fortunes around. And 
And lo and behold, they were able to capture power in 2000. You understand? So you need to start from somewhere. Mm. It cannot be that, oh, you want to win the next election if you are starting from now. You close your ranks, all those splinter groups within the Ukraine can come together, mm. shelve their partisan interests, or let's say, shelve their individual and selfish interests, and coalesce around maybe the ideology of the Kuma. Of course, with some modification, because the regencies of the time will detect certain rethinking uh, with regards to some of the key policy decisions of Nkrumah among others. So you need to look at that and look at the vision that it had for this country. And then re, you know, reinvigorate, rejuvenate some of the things that it did, and then you see how that can resonate with the broad masses of the people. But if you if you are divided, I mean, as the Bible says, the divided house cannot stand, uh, it is critical that they themselves will see themselves as one fighting for their own tradition. And perhaps yeah. sometimes not playing to the gallery, or not doing the dirty work of other political parties. Now, mm -hmm. if you are going to, if you are a political party and you are interested in just enhancing the capability or capacity of other political parties, I tell you, you will be in the position to the second coming of Christ. Yes. I see. Dr. Agridako, you've, you've been mentioned a lot of times about the Nkrumahist party or those who call yeah. themselves into the Nkrumahist yeah. people. Now, Almost every party now seems to tout uh, or toe that line. We are in Chromaist then we are in Chromaist party. How do we identify a true in <laughs> That's that's a, a huge a, a huge responsibility imposing on me this afternoon. Well, I mean, if I mean, you can't really know who and who are they, but those who believe in his ideologies. But as I said, if you know the Nkrumahist tradition or the Nkrumahism is a huge tradition. But you see, there are too many people who think that they are Nkrumahist. Even within the NDC, you know, there are some people who, or within the major political party, you find some people who think that they are Nkrumahist. Now, what is critical is that you, you, if you want to build that tradition into, into a, a potent force to reckon with, then you must forge. A united front. That's what I'm saying. Mm. So, so one if you don't forge that united front, and you all claim that you're Nkrumahs, you even confuse the word "electorate." So, who are the real Nkrumahs? And people will think that look, these are selfish individuals seeking to use Nkrumahs' name to, to you no, know, cashing in on Nkrumahs' name to mm. make to make themselves popular. But if you forge a united front, people will see that look, this is a group, this is Nkrumahs, this is a tradition to go. If there are too many splinter groups, I mean, it confuses everybody and. The end result is that you are not able to maximize the benefit that the chromaism should naturally, you know, uh, inure to the group of people who subscribe to his ideologies fundamentally. But it doesn't mean, if I'm talking about chromaism, it doesn't mean that the others, the PPPs and the, 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 the those on leave, and, you know, the individual, uh, what do you call it, uh, independent candidates and, uh, and others, are irrelevant and must be relegated to their background. It all depends on how they organize themselves, mm. basically, and appeal to the broad masses of our people, demonstrate capacity, demonstrate that they have the national interest at heart. It looks as if that, as, in fact, as we argue, it looks as if all of us have abdicated. I don't see the people who defend the national interest. In any issue, anything, even communal spirit of the average Ghanaian is, is withering away. And, and we need, we have leaders who have to sit down and rethink and recreate, maybe sign a new contract mm. with Ghana, or we must actually develop maybe a Ghana project mm. and re-establish that project and make sure that it's a corporate body, corporate entity that ownership is vested in all of us, and then we can move on. So, and for now, mm. too many politicians, too many divisive tendencies, too many you know, people who are seeking their own selfish interests as against the national interest, and I think that that's important for you know, mm. an, an enduring democracy, mm. which is also interested in achieving some measure of development for its people. Mm. Doc, pleasure talking to you here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We've been speaking to political science lecturer at the University of Ghana, Dr. Evans Agri-Dako.